so today's webinar is being organized by Clay Matrix, and we're featuring Tableau Zen master Kevin Fredarch, who has graciously agreed to uh, you know spend time with us and explain to us how to improve our data visualizations using the very well-known software Tableau. Um, I won't take up much of your time. I think Mr. Rawat will can introduce Kevin better and he'll say a few words before we start the webinar for sure. Thank you. So welcome everyone. And again, it's a great honor to host Kevin uh, on our webinar. So Climatics Data Labs is very happy to have Kevin, uh, you over here. And I think more of the part most of the partisan have not joined yet and they will be joining in but uh, let's let's not uh, let's stick to the timelines uh, because it's already six over here so uh, welcome everyone and uh, kevin uh, needs no introduction in data visualization space he is a he's one of the tableau zen masters uh, he's also one of the leads in uh, tableau user group in cincinnati and he's been helping uh, budding data visualizers ac across the globe uh, he helps them and he I myself uh, kind of uh, got a chance to interact with Kevin once. I was working on a no polygon uh, charts and I came across his uh, one of his blogs. And that's where I got to know about Kevin and he's doing a tremendous work uh, apart from being a great uh, data visualizer, he's a great human being also. I mean, you can just touch base with him anytime and he doesn't uh, hesitate in helping you if he has time. So Kevin, thanks a lot once again. Uh, I'll not take much of your time and uh, uh, let, let's start now, Kevin. I mean, over to you. All right, All right. let me share. And can everybody see my slides? Yeah, Kevin, you can see everything. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. I appreciate the, the kind words for sure. Um, my name is Kevin Fleurledge. Um, I am, uh, uh, honestly, I just uh, got a promotion, so I'm not, that's not my title anymore. I forgot to update it. So I'm a manager of business intelligence at a company called Unifund in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, you may know a little bit about us. We're, I'm an identical twin. So I'm there on the left that, and that's my Twin brother Ken on the right. Um, you can. This is uh, taken a couple of years ago. Ken's been using Tableau a couple of years longer than me. You can see his shirt says uh, Zen Master. So Zen Master is a real thing. I know they mentioned it before, but uh, there's there's 34 Zen Masters in the world, uh, selected, nominated by community of people, and and selected by Tableau themselves. Um, Ken's a now up coming up on. Uh, four years the Zen Master, and I'll be um, here in the next month uh, on my second year of being a Zen Master. So uh, identical twin Zen Masters is pretty cool. And we also went, run the website FleurlichTwins.com, which has just a lot of Tableau content on there. We pretty much put a, a blog post out every week. Um, yeah, Zen Master, I'm, I'm a Tableau Public Ambassador, uh, and a few other things we won't even we won't bother getting into. So for me, most presentations tend to focus on technical how-tos. I do lots of stuff on you know fixed LEDs and new features and oops, and uh, you know dashboard action, spatial analysis. Those types of things are what I typically present on. Um, but people always seem to ask the question, "What about design?" And it's a little bit of a tricky one because it can be somewhat hard to teach. When my brother and I were young, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, I'm 44 now. Um, when we were young, 10, 11 years old, all we did was, was draw. We loved to draw cartoons, transformers. We the thing of the Grinch there on the left is my brother's, Pinocchio on the right. Mine, again, we we're probably nine, 10, 11 years old at this point. And we inevitably we got this question of how do you draw like that? And it was always something that was difficult to answer. We didn't really know how to teach somebody to draw. So I think the design in, in any data visual, visualization software, Tableau is the tool that I use. I think it it's, can be a little bit hard to learn. Uh, but how do you learn it? Well, I think it certainly takes some natural talent, some training, practice, uh, probably, maybe most importantly, emulating others. 
There's a quote from Paul Rand that says, design can be art, design can be aesthetics. Design is so simple, that is why it's so complicated. And I feel like that applies to uh, data visualization. So today's goal is to make it simple. We don't want it to be complicated, let's, let's make it simple. And throughout the uh, today, we're going to be talking, uh, we're gonna be showing two examples. Uh, the first is going to be an example of what I consider bad design, and the second is going to be an example of what I consider good design, okay? And they'll be notated with the, the red thumbs down and the blue thumbs up. So just a quick example. Bad design, my brother Ken Flerlich, good design, me. I know you guys are all cracking up right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, my definition of, of design. So I don't want you to think that we're talking, you know, illustrator or, um, or you know, some, you know, really intense design software. We are talking about design in uh, data visualization, specifically Tableau. And I'll use that term design very loosely. We're gonna be talking lots of different things. We're gonna be talking uh, more than anything about best practices. So color, layout, alignment, um, you know, aspect ratio, size, um, uh, all kinds of things, fonts, selections, and, you know, and we're really gonna dig into the way something looks, aesthetics. But for the most part, we're gonna be talking about best practices and talking about how uh, we can design a visualization to make it more uh, legible, uh, easier for somebody to uh, get information from quickly. Um, so we're, yeah, I'm not going to touch uh, touch on everything about design. We're just going to take simple steps to improve our design. So I have 26 different examples. I'm going to show you an example of, of, of a good design, an example of a bad design, and we'll kind of talk through that. No, I assume it's being recorded, but no reason to take notes or anything like that. Uh, I have a full blog post on this uh, exact topic. Should it goes through pretty much every example. It has a Tableau uh, a workbook that you can download from Tableau Public as well. So there is the link and you can go there anytime. So let's jump into Tableau. All right, and so I did mention there's 26 of these. And so at times may feel, uh, I use the word listy. It's not really a word, I don't think, but uh, but we are gonna just try and hit a bunch at a time. We'll take a little break in the middle and then we'll hit a bunch more. So, all right, so we're gonna start off really simple and we're gonna look at titles. Um, I guess I could put this in full screen. We're going to look at titles. Um, this is just a mistake that I see uh, on a regular basis where people don't put a title. And why is the title so important? Well, it gives your user immediately some information about what a da your data visualization is about. So here, well, the user has to take some time to kind of understand what we're even focuses, focusing on before they can actually focus on the data. In this case, you know, immediately we're talking sales and profit. So, um, Really simple, just add a title. There's lots of discussions on how you how you build a title. And you know, that sounds kind of silly, maybe, but some people say you should ask a question. Some people say you should have a title and a subtitle. I'm not gonna propose one or the other. I'm just gonna say have some sort of title uh, so that uh, your people can understand, your audience can understand what you're talking about immediately. All right, grid lines. Grid lines are can be really, really helpful in helping a data visualization be read and understand and interpreted. Uh, but what I always say is don't make them the star of the show. So we see the red one here on the left where we have these really dark grid lines. We have them vertical grid lines. We have horizontal grid lines. The bars are going horizontal. So I don't really know why we would need horizontal grid lines. Uh, we have these grid lines that are showing every $20,000. It's just far too much. And if you're anything like me, what I see is the grid lines and not the bars. My eyes go straight to the grid lines. I don't even pay attention to the bars. So um, what we want to try to do with grid lines is make them helpful, but put them behind the, the data visualization, make them um, something that helps, but not the star of the show. So in this case, I've taken these grid lines that are every 20,000, made them every 50,000. Uh, since we have horizontal bars, there's no reason for horizontal grid lines. So I got rid of those and I made them really, really light. I make them usually a light gray and dotted. And then we have this helpful information. We can quickly look at this and, and gather that this is probably three and I don't have a tooltip on, but 
probably gather that that's probably about $320,000 in sales. So uh, grid lines are, are helpful. Uh, a lot of times people just get rid of them all together. You know, we could certainly get rid of them all together and put labels on the end of the bars. But if you're going to use them, certainly uh, don't make them the star of the show. I'm going to talk about hex maps in th three different occasions here. Um, this is happens to be a hex map of the United States. Uh, but there's hex maps um, um, coordinates all over the place. Um, I tend to use, uh, for hex maps, I tend to use just an XY coordinate. So this is generally a scatter plot with a hex shape in here. Uh, I have a blog post uh, that you can uh, that you can go to if you go to this table of public visualization that talks about all the different varieties and methods of doing hex maps. You can do shape files and and polygons and all kinds of things, but I tend to just use just simple uh, shapes on, on a scatter plot. And uh, I tend to see a, a lot of a lot of issues when people build hex maps. Uh, first and foremost, people use the wrong shape. So and you see um, when this when a hex map the hex map was really uh, initially developed, it was developed with a shape that uh, what I would say is uh, vertically oriented. The the point they kind of point up and down, right? And it's the, it doesn't really matter if it's horizontal or vertical, but it happens that the person who developed the coordinates for the original hex map, his name is Matt Chambers, he used this shape. So uh, if you use a different shape, these pieces don't, uh, the, the kind of cool term now is tessellate. They don't fit together. Uh, you can see these weird gaps uh, where these fit in and fit really, really nicely. So the first takeaway for uh, hex maps is use the correct shape. Use a vertically uh, oriented hex uh, hexagon versus a horizontal hexagon. The second is, is spacing. Uh, I always try to make my sh hex shapes as large as possible without them overlapping, just maybe a little bit of padding in between them. Here, what we see is it's kind of hard to read. It's kind of hard to interpret. It's uh, the labels are hard to see. Um, uh, something odd happens when your shapes are small as the labels seem to be misaligned, even though they're centered here, they seem to be misaligned. So, uh, so I always recommend people make their hex shapes as large as possible without overlap. And then the third thing would be just to have the same vertical spacing as you have, you know, horizontal spacing, right? So here we, we can see the spacing all around this hex map is, is the same, right? But here we have uh, this big gap horizontally and they're almost touching each other vertically. So uh, we should try to have that same spacing all around. You're going to have, uh, in the end, you're going to have a hex map that's a lot easier to read uh, and a lot more pleasing to the eyes, a lot more, uh, you know, a lot better aesthetic to it than, than these ones with the wrong shapes or, or, or bad spacing. I uh, spent Mm, about 13 years of my career doing data analytics in Excel alone. Um, so I did a lot of charts like this, where we have uh, the months on the axis and we have, uh, you know, bars or something like that. And what I've learned through my time in data visualization is these, this rotated text can be really, really difficult. And if you're anything like me, I'm, I'm almost have to, to rotate my head to read what those axis labels are saying. In Excel, you can kind of angle them or something like that, and probably other tools you can do that as well. Um, but there, there are better ways to do it in, in Tableau. Um, so right now I'm looking at March 2017 to December 2018. What we can do is uh, to avoid this rotated text and, and avoid it being so difficult for our, our audience, our users to read. Uh, what I like to do is just abbreviate it with one one uh, an, uh, letter, so March, April, May, and then we can use an additional blue pill um, to show the year. So this is pretty quick, quick to read. I think a lot quicker than you know this rotated text. Uh, we can quickly see that we have June 2017, October 2017, April 2018, or if, I guess that would be August. My bad. Um, you could use if you have the space. You could use three letters. I I tend to use three letters more than one, but if you're cramped on space, using one is fine. Um, but I always think it's better than rotated text. I, I almost never have rotated text in my data visualizations just because it's difficult for the re reader to uh, get at and understand. All right, floating bars. This is, uh, I, 
I work for a company called Unifund. We happen to have two Zen masters that work there. Uh, Jeffrey Schaefer is the um, chief operating officer of, of Unifund. We're a 120 person company, um, pretty small. Um, he, if you don't know Jeffrey Schaefer, he's um, a five time Zen master. I'm certain he's gonna go in the Zen master hall of fame this year, uh, brilliant guy. Uh, teaches data visualization, has the book, uh, book Big Book of Dashboard, he's co-authored, uh, just credential after credential, and the guy is one of the smartest gentlemen I've ever met. One of his pet peeves in data visualization is floating bars. So what I mean by floating bars are these bars that are just kind of floating out here in space. There's nothing to really anchor them. Um, sure, I mean, they're good bar charts. You can still compare the length and all that, but um, it, he always says that we should have some sort of base to anchor our, our bar charts. And that's just an axis ruler. And this has been something that's kind of been drove into my head as well. So I can't, when I see floating bars, I have to go add an axis ruler. So there's a blog post by Ryan Sleeper, another, uh, another Zen master. Um, he just talks about giving your base. This is the most popular blog post on his website, by the way, it's uh, Playfair data. Um, he, his, he says, you know, just you need your bar charts to have a base, a solid foundation. And he talks about this same exact thing. So don't float your bars, add an axis ruler for those uh, bars to really uh, be anchored to. <clears throat> All right, categorical colors, we'll dig into this a little bit. So here I'm using Superstore data. I'm showing sales by subcategory. And you see we have some decent grid lines like we did before. And the problem here is that I have subcategory on the color card. I'm getting a color for every subcategory. So what we have here is sort of the psychological thing um, for a user in that they see color and then they start to try to interpret what color means in this particular chart. So your user is now trying to figure out He's spending less time thinking about the, you know, the length of that bar and for every subcategory, he's thinking about what's that color mean. And the truth is it really means nothing. Um, the, the labels are clearly notating the difference between phones and chairs and storage. And we don't really need color to do that. So what you're basically doing is wasting a user's time when you, when you do this. Um, and, and I, I should say before I, I continue, I probably should have said this early on, all these are guidelines, they're, they're guardrails. They're not hard and fast rules. There are always times when you break rules in data visualization. Um, so this isn't always gonna be the case. Everything I've said so far isn't always gonna be the case, but in 99% of situations, we wouldn't want to do something like this when the, when the subcategories are clearly labeled. Instead, make them all the same color. The length of the bar is what matters and you have a label out here to, to the side that says, what, what values it's representing. So, um, you know, you can make them all gray and you could highlight one that you're interested in. If you are the chair, chair salesman, you may want to highlight the red chairs, you know, the bar, uh, the chairs bar red and have everything else gray. But in general, we don't want to use categorical colors. Now I said, we, there's always times where we break the rules. Um, I, this is going to refresh on me probably. I got people in my way here. <laughs> um, we've got this the zoom bar is kind of get me. Uh, this, if, if, if you see a, on the back of my wall, I actually have this visualization hanging on my wall here. My wife got that for me for Christmas. This is a table of public visualization that I did called Movie Money. And what it looks at is uh, in 2019, all the different movies uh, that were released and uh, their gross revenues. If you see, you'll probably see, um, you, I have these broken out by month. All these little dots are an individual release movie. Uh, each one of these is representing the, the month in which it was released. I was curious in when movies were released and when popular movies were released. And you'll probably see what, that I did exactly what I said not to do in that other, um, in, in just now where I used uh, a different color for every month. The reason I did that is because that's encoded throughout the entire visualization. All the Januarys are red, all the Mays are green, all the Decembers are pink. And if we scroll down, that carries through. We can quickly see that this pink one without even using the tooltip is December and this red one is January. 
uh, I have a little toggle on this and that's when it's going to refresh on me. And for some reason it keeps to shooting it over to the left and doing something weird. And I can't seem to scroll it, but we'll just kind of jump out. Um, try that again. In this case, I've decided to add it, added a toggle to see what, um, which, um, studios are, are producing these movies. So we see these big red dots. There's not a lot of them, but they're big. They're all Walt Disney. And then you see some of these smaller orange ones. Those are Warner Brothers. And again, I'm using categorical color just because throughout the entire visualization, I'm using that color to denote that particular item. Just an interesting insight. Walt Disney had the six top grossing movies in 2019 alone. They actually had seven out of eight. So pretty crazy. Um, so there are certainly times when we use categorical colors. Um, it's just not most of the time. So like I said, there's always times where we might break the rules. It's, if you're not aware, um, I think it's somewhere around eight or nine percent of the male population has some type of color blindness, some type of color deficiency. It's much smaller in women, but women still have have those issues. I think it's more like one or two percent. But generally speaking, about 10 percent of the population has some sort of color deficiency. The most common one, and I can't remember exactly the name, is basically red green color blindness. And we've, we've probably all heard this. Tableau used to have default colors of red and green for kind of good and bad, I guess. And uh, Tableau has stopped doing that because some a huge percent of the population has some sort of color deficiency. They now have this sort of standard red, or excuse me, orange and, and blue. Um, my, my dad is colorblind. So, and sometimes I think that I might be partially because there's certain things that I can't see very well. Um, so in our data visualizations, especially when we're developing for large groups, it's very, very um, important that we design for color deficiency. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this. There's a great blog post from, from my boss, Jeff Schaefer, on his website, Jet Data Plus Science, where he really digs into the idea of color and, and really drives it home. Um, but um, what I recommend that you do when you're when you're building a visual excuse me a visualization is to just use a color simulator so we talk about red and green really really often but there are other colors that in the same sort of tones that are really difficult as well this is red and brown i can see this just fine but somebody with color deficiency might not so there are color simulators uh, i think my the one that i use is Coblis. um actually have a link to it right here um, but if we click this to simulate it, it's a little bit small, but this is normal vision. We see this sort of red and brown, and then we, uh, this is um, uh, two different uh, colors over here, or the orange and blue. And then uh, the most common co form of color blindness, and I'm not even trying to pronounce it, you can see those red and browns blend together. You can barely tell the difference at all, where the blue and orange are pretty easy to understand. So generally speaking, if you add in any sort of tint of blue, you're going to be fairly safe in, in, in people being able to decipher those two colors. So um, really the key here is use a colorblind simulator, make sure that your data visualizations are safe for people with color deficiencies, um, because this chart is going to be in, impossible to, uh, to interpret if the, the colors are look the same. This is probably more of a pet peeve than anything. <laughs> it's not, uh, this may not be a standard principle, but what I tell people is always avoid, I, I see this, if you're familiar with the Makeover Monday project, um, I see this a lot where people build these highlight tables and they're really wide. And I think what they try to do is fill the space. I never worry about filling the space. White space is good. I'll talk about white space later, but um, so I often see these, these highlight tables that uh, stretch all the way across the screen. And uh, though they don't look very nice, um, they also are harder to interpret. It's much harder to compare a value of Sunday in January to Saturday in December because they are so far apart. I almost have to turn my head to make those comparisons. So when I build a highlight table, I always recommend that you make them as close to square as possible. Each little individual cell should be as close to square as possible. Now I can see January and December basically without moving my eyes. I can compare them much easier. It looks a lot nicer. And that white space, 
white space is good. White space is always a good thing. Don't be afraid to have a little bit of white space. All right, stacked bars. Um, I will stay from the beginning. Uh, I made a mistake in this one and, and I'll tell you why, um, but uh, we'll kind of walk through this. So stacked bars are, are a common chart. Um, I try to avoid them most of the time for, for several reasons, but we'll kind of talk about some reasons why you might use them and how to use them better. Um, so a stack bar chart, this is really good for me to be able to see sales by quarter. So it's pretty obvious that uh, 2018 Q4 sales were the greatest out of any other quarter here. We can see Q3 2017 was about fifth. So to compare the entire sales for the entire quarter is really, really easy. These length of these bars tell me that, tell me that information. Also, if I'm comparing say bookcases, this, this green color, it's really easy for me to compare. I can tell that Q3 2016, we had the highest sales of bookcases. But if I were to ask you what were our highest sales for uh, appliances, that becomes a lot more difficult or for binders or for accessories. And the reason, especially accessories, I, I can't tell. This one's, this one's larger than this one. Uh, it's really difficult. And the reason is they don't have the shared access. They don't start at the same point. Um, it's, and that's the power of a bar chart in general is, is to be able to compare length. And when they start at different positions, you can't compare length. So in most cases, I will break my stack bars apart. And here's where I failed. Uh, in this example, I've taken a, a, these four different uh, subcategories and I've broken them into their individual bars. And that makes it really easy for me to compare accessories against each other, appliances against each other. I can tell you know, where those binders are, where I, that was my example before, which one is the largest value. But what I can't tell is the total value for the quarter. So there are really kind of two ways, in my opinion, to solve this. We could add a grand total out to the right. That would work perfectly well. Uh, that would allow us to compare the totals. That would compare, allow us to compare the values within. Uh, that works really, really well. It may take up a little bit more space than a stacked bar, but it, it works good. And that's what I typically do. I feel like it's the easiest way to interpret. And then I would allow users to maybe, there's little tricks with parameter actions to, to sort these values um, within their category. But there's a, a cooler trick, in, in my opinion, and save some space. And you can do this with a, um, a stacked bar. And I'm going to go to that website. This is again from Ryan Sleeper I talked about before. What he does, and, and, and like I said, the, the real problem with this, the stacked bar is there's only this one value that's along the axis. So you can't compare the other ones. Well, he solves that problem by allowing you allowing users to interact with the chart by clicking on a segment. So here he clicks on south and he sends south to the axis. So now you can compare those red values um, by sending to the axis. He's using a set action here. So he's allowing you to multi-select, but basically what he's allowing you to do is use a stack bar chart because it does have a lot of value, but then you can send any segment of that stack bar chart to the axis so you can uh, eat more easily compare. So really, really great technique. I use that all the time and I'm just trending towards uh, using more stacked bar charts in, in my data visualizations because of that trick. You've probably heard lots of information on, on not using pie charts and not using donut charts. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily in that, um, in that group. Um, I am in the group of, however, not using it with a 12 or 13 or 15 different slices. This is really hard to compare. And if I were to put this in a bar chart, it'd be really easy for us to tell whether this with this value here is greater than this value or this value here is greater than this value. But the fact that we've kind of put it in this radial format, um, these pie slices are, are, are difficult to compare. I think it gets even harder to compare with a donut chart, even though generally I prefer a donut chart over a pie chart. Um, so uh, my, my caution here is don't use a pie chart if you're gonna use more than three slices because it's really hard to compare. So in this case, I think uh, I'm using only two slices. It, it's really easy to interpret. We're all used to looking at a clock. We're all used to eating pizza or, or a pie. And uh, it's pretty easy to tell that that blue segment is, you know, 18, 19, even when it didn't have the label, we could probably tell that's around 20%. And so we can get this quick information. So uh, my advice for pie charts is don't use them if you're using more than three slices. Uh, and a lot of times just use a bar chart instead. <laughs> 
I use a bar. We don't on our Tableau server at work. We have about 900 views. We're a small company, but we still have about 900 views. We have a total of zero pie charts <laughs> on our server, so uh, it's not something we commonly use. We almost always use a, uh, a bar chart. Now we could also get in the argument of should we use radial charts? Well, in this case, I would say a standard bar chart would be a much better um, chart to use and, uh, rather than a, a radial chart. But if you were to use them, and, and I'll apply the same concept to waffle charts, I do think there's a, a place uh, and time to use waffle charts. If you're familiar with waffle charts, just a, a grid of 100 uh, squares or 100 dots to, to show a percentage. Um, they're really really effective with small percentages. So it's hard to show if you have a value of 99% and you have a value of 1%, that 1% doesn't show very well in a bar chart. It shows really, really well and really, really obvious in a, in a waffle chart. So there are certain times for waffle charts. But if you're going to use a, a radio chart or a waffle chart, uh, I recommend using a one-to-one -one ratio. So for a radio chart, that should mean that your chart's going to be circular. Uh, and for a waffle chart, that means your chart is going to be square. Why? Well, for me, it just looks a thousand times better. This looks really weird, <laughs> if you ask me. And this looks really beautiful, if you ask me. Uh, the other problem is when you smash a radial chart, you are actually um, making the lengths of these bars different. So the length of this bar, it, let's say if, uh, this is showing percentage. So this bar shows 84.6%, but this total gray area is 100%. The length of this 100% here is much longer than this here because we've squished it. So we're actually making this radio chart that's probably a little bit hard to interpret in the first place, even harder to interpret. Um, and then when you talk about waffle charts, I just think it's more about the aesthetics. So uh, try to keep a one-to-one -one ratio and um, and uh, make your radio chart circular and waffle charts square. All right, I feel like that was a lot. I see some stuff coming through. I'm not actually checking the chat. So if there's questions that, that people wanna ask now or we can ask them later, that's fine. Uh, happy to address all that. Uh, but I did wanna take sort of a quick break uh, just because that was a, a lot of information. I hear somebody jumping in. Did somebody wanna ask a question? Uh, so we can't hear you. I, I can't hear you. Kevin, I was saying uh, you want to take a break or you want to have a five minutes Q&A right now? And that's fine. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. So anybody has any questions, Kevin, can, you can ask to Kevin five minutes and then he can start up to five minutes. And Kevin, do let us know if you want to take a break. I mean, <laughs> I know you might be exhausted talking too much. I'm fine. We can, yeah, we can answer questions and, and push through for sure. Yeah. Uh, you guys can unmute yourselves or ask on the chat whichever one, whichever is comfortable. So, hi, Kevin. This is Sajid. So, uh, Kevin, I just need to check. I have already gone through your website and I got a lot of the information from there. Can we, can you please guide the best standard practice in the Tableau to use the standard color or standard formats or standard templates? We can go ahead and we can use it. What is the best standard way, way which can help us to specify our color theme or uh, some template or something? That's a really great question. Um, I think generally uh, standards are different across companies. I think, you know, you have these types of best practices that we're talking about today. Um, got lots of light coming into my house all of a sudden. The sun's coming up, so I'm going to have to shut that. Um, so I think it really, really varies from, from company to company. In my company, we're fairly small. We have a small um, analytics team, so we don't have any really strict um, guidelines. There are, um, if you go to Tableau Public and you search for JLL, they have a really good um, um, standards uh, document and and uh, and uh, Tableau workbook that you can that you can utilize and, and see how what they're using with it. Uh, I think they have just you know standard fonts, standard colors, um, standard ways they do different charts and and, and numbers. Um, but you know, I feel like that that it really varies from company to company, and it comes down to, from for the most part, these sort of best practices. I don't I don't personally have any sort of templates or anything like that with colors and fonts and things like that. So, uh, but I think that JLL on uh, uh, user on um, on Tableau Public might be helpful. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Thank you, Kevin, one more question I have. I go through a lot of the good visualization in your website and here also in the screen. So how we can go ahead, because mostly we are using the standard visualization like bar, donuts, or some of the butterfly charts. Those are the basic charts we can, visualization we are using in our projects or somewhere, right? But here I can go ahead and see a lot of the very good visualization. Do you have any suggestion where we can go ahead and little bit explore the new visualization, which are the little bit unique to implement in our projects? Yeah, so, so just to kind of clarify what this is, I was going to kind of promote Tableau Public a little bit because there's so many things out on Tableau Public, so many cool things that our people are doing. Now, would you, these are just five examples, some of my favorite visualizations on Tableau Public. None of these are mine. One of them is my brother's. I felt weird putting my own out here. <laughs> so uh, just really cool techniques and really beautiful and, and kind of works of art, right? These look like posters that you could hang on your wall. Um, now, would we use some of these chart types in our work? Probably not. I mean, we see that chart type out to the right. I mean, uh, it's really, really cool looking, but it would probably be better to use a, a, a standard bar chart, like you said. And, and to be quite honest, in my work, I use a ton of bar charts. We've actually broken this down, looked at our top 30 or 40 viewed visualizations and found that, you know, the chart types we use, there were about 40% bar charts, I think you know, 20% line charts, you know, 10% maps. There wasn't this crazy stuff like you see here, these curvy lines and and uh, and kind of a unique charts. Now, uh, so, so that's kind of, you know, how it looks at work. Now, in my personal life, um, we, can, we can go there, if I can escape here and just hit this. In my personal life, I'd like to do crazy stuff like I would never do this at work but I would do it here you know or these flower charts or you know these curvy lines I'd like to do that kind of stuff and and I think the one of the reasons that we can do that is and why we should do that is because it really flexes our, our tableau muscle right we can if we can learn to create curvy lines or we can do radio charts uh, you know this uses a lot of trigonometry to make this kind of circular tornado chart um, or this one as well, um, we really start to learn a lot about how Tableau works in, in the back end. We can learn a lot about um, um, table calculations, especially when we're doing these kind of curvy lines and things. So there's lots of great reasons to do it, uh, although you will not see anything like this on my Tableau server at work uh, because it's not typically kind of a, a quick insight type of stuff that that I want to do. Now, if you want to do them, uh, there's there's lots of resources. We have a lot of, of resources on our website. Uh, one in particular um, talks about, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking for some reason on the, um, on the um, name of the blog post, but it really talks about, um, okay, beyond show me, that's what it is, sorry. I can't believe I forgot about that. But Beyond Show Me talks about going beyond the Show Me panel. And it talks about, it really digs into um, the XY coordinates. If you can find the XY coordinates um, for something, you can build any chart using the scatter plot, right? So mm -hmm. all these sort of crazy radial charts that you see are basically scatter plots where people use trigonometry to, to calculate coordinates and, and plot them on on a scatter plot. So um, if you want to sort of dip your toe into doing some unique charts, I would start with this Beyond Show Me series. It's a three-part series on our website that my brother wrote. Uh, we also, um, Ken and I did a presentation at the Tableau Conference in 2019. Um, you can actually go here and, um, and watch a, a, an hour video on how to really go beyond that sort of show me uh, panel and Tableau. So that's, I, I won't go into too many more specifics, but um, that will kind of get you started on that path if you're interested in doing that. I still will be really, uh, really careful in, in what you do at work because I still think there is a reason why bar charts are so popular because they're really easy to read and they're really, really effective where this radial bar chart is much less effective than say a, a standard bar chart. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy. Sure. Kevin, I have one, um, actually two. <laughs> so uh, uh, one question is, um, 
Uh, I wonder if there's a way to do it, but uh, can we, and also it's a digress from the topic you're covering right now, uh, the, the LOD calculations and the filters, we know they follow a hierarchy. Is there a way where we can uh, not follow that hierarchy? It's coming from a business problem that we're facing uh, right now. Is there a way wherein we can, like, I don't know, LOD come before some of the filters? So can we kind of get uh, rid of that? That is question number one. And another question is, um, generally, when we work with the live connections, uh, if you're not having an extract, let's say I'm linking it to some database, um, my um, experience in terms of how I uh, have uh, the interactivity with the visualization goes off because it hangs, it's a little slow, the runtime is too, taking too much. So what would be your advice for enhancing or optimizing uh, at that level, at that point of time? Uh, question number one, I mean, the order operations is in Tableau is what it is. Uh, I mean, certainly you can you can um, change a, a filter to a context filter if you want that to happen before a, a fixed LOD. Um, if you're if that's not if that's not the problem, then yeah, I mean it's it, you kind of have to follow the the order of operations in Tableau. Um, there are lots of tricks using table calculations. Table calculations happen way down at the bottom of of um, the order of operations, where you know you have your 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 um, context filters, and then your fixed LEDs, and then your dimension filters, and then table table calculations happen way down below. So there are lots of different tricks for uh, for table calculations, and you can create table calculations as filters um, to kind of have, have make things happen in the order that you want. But uh, there's no way that you can sort of change what the order of operations is, other than you know some of these different techniques. I think we do have, um, my brother has a blog post, uh, again, on flourishtwins.com, uh, all about the order of operations. And he talks about several use cases on um, on how to kind of trick the order of operations into, into your favor. Um, the second question was more about, I guess, more about performance. Um, and uh, it, did you say that there was a reason that they could not use an extract? I mean, that's obviously the first option to get something to, to run more quickly when published. Yeah, so at times uh, you have to go for a live connection. And even if you use an extract, at times uh, uh, it's not that fast enough. So I'm, we can use that performance uh, tool that is then Tableau. I use it quite often. But I mean, if there are anything that we might have missed out, uh, maybe you can throw light on that. Yeah, I, I'll be really honest. So it's, I'm, I'm the far far from an expert in, in optimizing a Tableau workbook. I mean, yeah, if you can trim down the number of fields you have in there, uh, if you hide unused fields, that that helps. Uh, you know, and you know, obviously being able to extract it. Um, so I probably, without getting in, you know, the, using that performance tracking tools is very very helpful. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a great uh, solution without kind of getting my hands on it. Uh, if you're familiar, I have a link to it somewhere. I could probably grab it and send it to you, but I, I have a really great video um, of a guy that just did a really quick 20 minute presentation on, on optimizing your workbooks and it had some really great tips in there. That may be helpful. If I, if I can, can get that together, I can, uh, I can send that to you later and maybe that'll be helpful. Yeah, that would help. Thanks. Yeah, let me write it up real quick before I forget. Uh, it's a really quick watch. I think only uh, only um, twenty minutes. So. so, Angad, can we I mean hold the questions now, and then let's begin uh, continue with the presentation, and then at the end of it, Kevin can, if he has time, he can take the questions after that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and kind of what I was talking about before is if you're not on Tableau Public, create an account, start following people. You can follow me and maybe follow some of the people I'm following. Uh, I think it's just a great way to kind of make Tableau or Tableau and data visualization uh, fun outside of, of your work stuff. You know, you might do work stuff and you've come home and you're like, I don't, I don't want to think about it. But um, I find it really fun to just build, build beautiful data visualizations, infographics, try new techniques. So, uh, I mean, these are just, like I said, five of the five of the coolest ones. This is like 
one of the first things I saw in Tableau when I first started and said like, oh my gosh, you can do this in Tableau. I, I got to do this. So uh, so if you're not on there, check it out. Um, I think you'll be inspired and, and have a little bit of fun with it. So, All right, back to uh, our kind of best practices and design talk. Um, we'll talk about labeling. Lots of people have written blog posts on clutter and removing clutter from a visualization. And here we have, uh, looks like two years worth of sales data and a line chart. And we've labeled every single uh, month with a, a value. And one in, in, in your head, you might say, well, that, that would make it easier to read, right? I know every single value. Well, it's not. <laughs> you can see on the left, it's really, really difficult to read and really kind of even understand where each mark, you know, which each dollar amount is marking. <coughs> so one of the keys in data visualization is, re is remove, removing clutter. Um, if I have a line chart like this, where there's, you know, 24 months that's being represented, uh, I tend to uh, mark two points. I tend to mark min and max, um, uh, first and the last, which is what I've done here. Um, and, and to be quite honest, we have an axis. We have a Y axis here showing zero, uh, you know, nothing up to 80,000. We probably don't need the labels at all. Um, I tend to like to use, you know, one or two labels just to kind of mark a, a point or two. Um, but the, the key, what, I, what I'm getting at is just be selective and, and label just a few points. You don't need all that clutter. It's not helpful. And it's actually makes it harder to read. So, all right. Scoot over a little bit and then icon usage. Um, there is a great video. If you're familiar with Zen Master Chantilly Jagernoth, she is she's just an awesome person, really, really brilliant, very young, and just has done so much in her in her short short time and um, leads leads a group of um, millennials in data is what she calls it, mad. So she's just she's just an all-star of it. At the Tableau Conference in 2019, she talked about design. She, I was developing these blog posts. Uh, I was almost done with it when I listened to her presentation. One of the things she really focused on, focused a lot of energy on, was icons. She really loves to use icons, and I agree with her. It's a really easy way to kind of add a little bit to your visualization. And honestly, it's really easy to quickly understand what a lot of icons mean. I think if we look at these icons, we can see it's 10 pin bowling and boxing and soccer, right? Or, or football, I call it soccer here in the United States. So, um, and um, so I, you can, I, using icons, I think are, are, is a really valuable thing. I do it a lot. Um, if we're going to use icons, it's really key to use consistent icons. So if we look at the left, we have the first icon that's the sort of square uh, outline icon. And then we have uh, another one that's sort of this cartoon. And then we have this uh, soccer ball, football, that's uh, the sort of sketch. There's no, there's no consistency between them. It's off-putting and it's just not uh, what I would expect to see in a good data visualization. Uh, on the right, we have very consistent icons, all these sort of uh, outline icons with the round circle. Um, in fact, these are all made by the same designer. I use a, a tool called the Noun Project. Um, it's an annual subscription. And um, you can go to icons and you can go to icon sets and you have icons that are created by the same designers. So, um, so generally, as a rule of thumb, use the same type of icons, use the same fill, use the same sort of outline, um, and just make them consistent if you're going to use them. Um, and, and I suggest you use them because I think they're really nice to add to a, a data visualization. Maps and backgrounds. So this is a common thing that I see. We might have this dashboard that has lots of different charts. And it, let's say it has a white background. And then we get to the map and it has this really blocky gray thing in the back and then the map, right? And it, it's, I think it's pretty obvious in, in this case, we're focused on the United States. We're not focused on Mexico. We're not focused on the Bahamas or Canada. We're really focused on the United States. This is just, um, like almost intrusive when I'm looking through a data visualization with uh, a white background and then I get to this sort of blocky, blocky map. Um, this isn't always possible, but when possible, um, I, I suggest that people turn off that base layer on their map. So if you turn off the base layer 
Um, you can ch uncheck a lot of the, the different options and you can kind of clean it up and get to just the things you're focused on. I'll warn you, in this case, uh, if, if I didn't have values for say Colorado, Colorado would disappear. There are ways around that. I won't dig too much into that. But generally speaking, if we can focus on an area and not have that sort of blocky look, um, we can focus our, our, our users' attention on the United States and not Canada, Mexico, uh, then that's always a good thing. So turn off the base layer when possible is good. If you're using a dark background, uh, you can use a dark map, you're using a light background, you can use a light map. Um, but generally speaking, try and get that map to blend into your dashboard a bit better than, than having these sort of unnecessary backgrounds. Okay, transparency. So on the left, we have a scatter plot. I think we showed the same scatter plot earlier when we were talking color deficiency, but on the left, we don't have, uh, we have the um, opacity set all the way up, right? I can never remember which way that is. There's no transparency. Um, and we can see most of the dots, the separation of most of the dots, but down there toward the bottom around 100, 120, 140, we get this density of, of marks, then we have no idea how dense those marks are because uh, we have full opacity. We, every, everything is, there's no transparency to that, um, to that mark. So really kind of simple is, uh, if we're gonna use any type of chart where we have any type of overlap, jitter plots, um, scatter plots, um, you, know, and, you know, dot plots, those types of things. Uh, we wanna make sure we have some level of transparency. Um, I don't like you don't have an exact number, but just make sure that you can kind of see the density of the marks. And if we look at this chart versus this one, we can certainly see where most of those marks reside. Um, one other tip that I like to do is to give it an outline. Um, you can see we have this sort of outline. I like to use the same color as the background. So a lot of people just use gray, but I like to use for a white background, I like to use white. So you can't see the outline here, but you can see it when you have this, um, this overlap here. But uh, certainly use transparency when you're using any, creating any kind of type of chart with where the marks overlap. <laughs> All right, diverging colors. So we have two examples here. On the left, we have, we're showing sales by state on, in both of these charts. On the left, we're using a diverging color palette. And on the right, we're using a sequential color palette. And you can see the, the color keys down there at the bottom. Um, for me, when I look at that left one, I it takes me quite a while to start to understand what I'm seeing. I, I may quickly be able to recognize that California has the highest sales and that New York is somewhere in there. But then when I start to get to the that sort of white middle and the, the pink and then the red, it starts to become a little more confusing. And I think the reason behind that is this, this white mark where it goes from, from red to blue, again, a diversion color palette, this is, this is some obscure figure and we have no idea what it actually represents. So the, what I always recommend is when I'm using a diverging color palette where we kind of move from one color to white and then to another color, the only time I use a diverging color palette is when we have some sort of natural midpoint. Uh, some value that we understand what it is. This value, I have no idea what it is. Um, so if you have something, a natural midpoint such as zero, zero is a great one, um, or if you're comparing to a target, or if you're comparing to a value from a prior period, some known value, some natural midpoint uh, is the only time I suggest using a diverging color palette. And, and again, if you look at this map, it's going to, it should, it does me, every time I look at it, it takes me a little while to sort of interpret what, uh, what I'm seeing. Now on the right, I've just got a very simple sequential color palette. I'm going from a gray to a dark blue, and it's really easy to see which one has the highest values, which one has the lowest values. I can see California, New York, Texas, Washington. I can kind of walk down, you know, it looks like maybe Wyoming, um, um, I, I should be clear, I would use a hex map for this almost uh, probably 90% of the time because uh, this is not usually, it's too hard to see the little um, little states over here. But, uh, but for the most part, uh, don't use a diverging color palette unless you have that natural midpoint. Otherwise, use a sequential color palette. They're much easier for users to understand and interpret. 
kind of talked about this before with the, the highlight tables, these wide highlight tables. I also see people using these wide bar charts. They're just not necessary. This provides the same amount of information as this, except I on the, on the top one, I almost have to move my head left to right to, to see what furniture and then the sales value and office supplies and the sales value. Um, it's really unnecessary. Um, just avoid really lot wide charts when you don't need them. This is a lot easier to read than, than the top one. Number precision. Um, again, this is a, a rule that can always be broke, broken um, based on the industry you're in. But in most cases, I, or I'm in the financial services industry, 38.1382% um, uh, is very meaningless to me most of the time. Um, in most cases, I would round that number all the way to a whole number of, you know, 38%. I, I'm showing here 38.1%. But generally speaking, 38.1382% is kind of hard to read. It's difficult for your users to read. Uh, it takes more energy. Um, and almost probably 99% of situations, you don't need that kind of precision. You know, if you're sending um, a rocket to the moon, maybe you do need that kind of precision. Or if you're using very, very small figures, maybe you need that precision. So, but in most cases you can, um, you can reduce some of that precision, make it a little bit easier for your users to read. Uh, the same thing goes with large values, you know, 8,682,317 8, uh, can usually be trimmed back to 8.7 million. One of the tricks I love to use uh, I do this a lot with bands, big numbers at the top of my dashboards, and I don't have this on here, but um, what I like to do is create a, like a duplicate kit calculation. Let's say this is sum of sales. I might just duplicate the sales pill and change the default formatting and then put that on the tooltip. So if, you, if your users might be interested in this very precise number, what we can do is show this $8.7 million number throw this on the tooltip so when they hover, they get that very precise number. I do that in most of my tooltips just in case somebody wants to have um, the very, very specific number. But in general, if I'm having bands or something at the top of my dashboard, I would show um, something with much less precision. And I think you would agree this is easier to read than, than this, this is. Kevin, I'll interrupt you quickly here. Uh, where, sure. you, where we are showing these numbers in millions or billions, uh, is there a way to uh, put a mil M for a million or B for a billion automatically, uh, or we need to go for a, a calculated field for that? Yeah, so um, let me just go in here. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, what do I have? I just typed that in there. What a cheater I am. <laughs> Oh, I've got this in we, a different. Uh, we can do it in formatting the number. Yeah, yeah. So here's sales. And if we go, you can do it. If you have it on your your uh, chart, you can just right click and choose format. But you can also go to default properties, number format, and you have this in currency and display units. I can put it in thousands or millions or billions or um, or you know, there's two different options for billions. So actually, so what I was sorry? trying to so yeah that's formatting that that yeah that's uh, that's how you do it but what I was trying to ask was uh, at times let's say we have a number which is 0 0.001 million it doesn't make sense so maybe you gotcha. want to put a k so uh, these suffix <coughs> or prefix m b and k can they be automatically Dynamic? yeah yeah uh, the the short answer is no um, you can't. Uh, make this one sales pill dynamic to change with your with the values that are shown. So um, you can't say, you know, if this number is less than 1 million, use K. And if this number is greater than 1 use million, use M. But there are other ways to do that. Number one, you mentioned calculated field. You could do this with strings and all this crazy stuff. My preferred method, and I, and I have a blog post on this as well. Um, I, if you search my website for, um, I, I just search for the term calculations, um, you'll find uh, what you have to do is, and, and this is what I kind of alluded to just a moment ago, is if you duplicate this pill, what you can do is, let's just do it. Well, I won't go through the whole thing, but if I duplicate this, so I have sales, I can say this is sales in millions. This one is sales in um, thousands. Then what you can do is write a calculation that says if sales is greater than 
or equal to a million, then use the sales in millions field. If it's less than that, then use the sales in thousands pill. Then you set the default properties on each of those to be sales in millions. So what you're doing is not really dynamic, um, you know, dynamically changing those units on a single field. What you're doing is dynamically changing from one field to another field, even though they're, they're a duplicate of each other, if that makes sense. Um, so I have a blog post on that on, on my website and just talks about using multiple calculations to do that sort of dynamic formatting. And again, I use that all the time too, because 0. 0.0001 million is pretty useless, right? Did that make sense? Thanks, Kevin. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right. Back to full screen. And that's kind of what I was alluding to here. And I, I probably did a poor job of explaining to it. You know, if I have this set with default properties and millions, if I want to show this as a tooltip, even though they're both in uh, both the total sales, I would duplicate this pill. I would, you know, set the formatting on this one to be millions, set the formatting on this one to, you know, have no, no units, put that on the tooltip, and then I can show both of them. But it would, it would require me to use two different uh, fields, two different pills, even though they're duplicates of each other. So, okay. Thanks for helping me clarify that. All right, color encoding. Um, color encoding is, is important. Um, it's also a balancing act. So uh, if we look at the, at the left here, we have two different charts. Uh, we have one that looks like profit versus sales by segment. So the yellow is corporate, the blue is consumer. And then if I move my eyes downward, I see more yellow and blue. So even though it's profit and sales again, my assumption, even though there's a color code there, my assumption is it's gonna be the same as that first chart. My assumption is yellow is, is corporate and my um, blue is consumer. When in fact, I flip the color code on you and now it's furniture and office supplies. Um, that can be tricky on a user when uh, when they're taught that color is one thing and then you flip it on them. So um, in the second uh, in the good side, we have the yellow and blue for corporate and consumer. And then I switch it again and I use two different colors for furniture and office supplies. At a glance for this user, it's really easy for me to for them to, to know that the red and gray are, are different than the blue and the yellow. Now. I say that's a balancing act. Um, it, you could have twelve scatter plots on your on your on your dashboard, and all of them are showing different things. Do you really want to show, you know, thirty-two or thirty-four or you know twenty-four different colors in in your dashboard? Probably not. It kind of goes back to that categorical color thing that I talked to talked about. So again, this is a balancing act. Um, I don't think these category, I don't think these these color codes really do enough, in my opinion, to, to break that down. So if I had that kind of situation and I wanted to use a, you know, just two colors throughout, I think it's okay as long as you put it in the title. So in this case, I would put corporate versus consumer and I'd put corporate in this yellow, I'd put consumer in the blue. And then if we wanted to do it, use yellow and blue again, I'd put furniture and yellow and, you know, office supplies in blue. I think if you're going to use the same colors throughout, um, you have to be really, really clear in titles as their eyes kind of, we think about how people read a dashboard, um, as their eyes kind of move down the page, uh, they should see that color code not off to the side or off to the right. It's, and uh, using a title to do that's very key. So um, again, another blog post, if you go to this on my Tableau public page, you can go to this other blog post that talks about using color in uh, in data. Uh, data visualizations is written by Ava Murray for Forbes, actually. Great little blog post that kind of talks about some of these concepts as well. This is just a simple one. Um, you know, if you're using any sort of long dashboards, a lot of people use their mouse wheel to, to sort of scroll down. I do this a lot. And if you do this with a map, um, uh, sometimes you get this effect. That's okay, uh, but, but what I've found is users, most users, non-developers uh, don't know how to use this toolbar um, and they don't know how to kind of unpin it. Um, so what I recommend is, you know, this is a map of Ohio. This is, I actually live in Kentucky down here, right below Cincinnati. Um, 
but there's a map of Ohio, just calling out some key cities in Ohio. There's really zero reason for us to, to zoom in on this map. So if you don't need your user to zoom in on a map, um, these tools, like I said, are confusing to users. Just turn them off. You go to map options, turn off all the map options. Here, I'm using my mouse wheel. I'm scrolling. Nothing's happening. I don't have this weird, weird effect. I don't have this toolbar that keeps popping up and, and that uh, users don't know how to use. So um, generally speaking is, um, you know, if you don't need people to be able to zoom to certain areas, just turn the thing off. It's a lot cleaner for the end user. This is sort of seemingly obvious, um, but it's it, it's something that I see on a regular basis. Um, alignment is very, very key in, in, in data visualization. You want your charts to be aligned uh, both vertically and horizontally, um, or it just looks sloppy and it actually makes it hard, harder to interpret. So if we look at this left chart, um, this axis rulers aren't aligned horizontally. These aren't aligned vertically. Nothing here is aligned. In this case, they are aligned, you know, these these are horizontally aligned with this, this is vertically aligned with this, it makes this thing much cleaner, much neater product in the end. A um, Couple of different little tricks. Um, if you're using tiling, which um, I tend to tile most of my charts, especially in business and in my personal work, I, I float a lot more. Uh, they, when I, when I tile, when you tile, these things kind of fit in uh, for the most part and they, and they align very, very well. If you are a floater and you have to be sometimes, uh, you should always use, you should always design to a grid. A little trick here is if you hit just G on your keyboard, you don't have to do anything else, just hit G. And I'm in presentation mode, so it's not gonna work, but if I hit G, we'll get this grid here. So we get this grid and if I'm floating, I can use my layout here and sort of uh, you know, design this perfectly to a grid to where these things align just like I want. Um, that's the same as going up to dashboard show grid, by the way. Then you can go to grid options if you want. If you want to make these, these grids a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, you can make that size. But to, to, to toggle the grid on and off, just hit the G and hit the G again. So nice little tip. And uh, just make sure you're aligning your elements, designing to a grid. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. I'll tell you why here momentarily. Uh, this is a little bit outdated, but it used to be if you added a navigation button to Tableau, it came in looking like this. Uh, it looks similar to this, not quite like this anymore. <coughs> it's the same with a, a collapsible container. If you use collapsible containers or show high containers, it comes with you know, a hamburger menu, the three little lines and an X. I tend to think that's not uh, a, a, not a good way to use buttons. Uh, first off, I don't think the buttons look very nice. Uh, second is they give you no information on what, what you're about to do. So uh, I always recommend that people create their own custom buttons and uh, I'll give a user information on what's going to happen next. So if I was moving from the sales dashboard to the profit dashboard, my button would say profit dashboard. So I know as a user, when I click on the profit dashboard button, I'm going to go to the profit dashboard. Or if I'm opening a container that has information about the dashboard, maybe it said the button says more information. So rather than use this, um, you know, when you do create a, a, a button in, in Tableau, it does allow you to use a text button. So you can put in text here, but I just think the button is this sort of squared off look is sort of is sort of outdated. So I tend to create all my buttons in PowerPoint, and sometimes people are surprised by that, uh, but I'll. I'll just kind of show you how easy it is. And I use PowerPoint just because, you know, 99% of the population using, uh, you know, doing data visualization has access to PowerPoint, has some familiarity with PowerPoint, um, much more so than say Adobe Illustrator or something like that. But if we go up to, to insert shapes, pick the sort of rounded square, we can drag out a button. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but this is a little, these are white circles, but this was yellow. I, if I grab that, I can actually change how rounded that is. So I like to make them rounded. We change the shape fill to no fill, maybe make this outline weight a little bit bigger. I'd probably make it bigger than that, maybe make it um, white. Then we can add, um, if we come insert, we can add text here. 
right? And make that text larger. Uh, we can add an icon. And then what we really do is just select the whole thing, right click, save as picture. And then we can bring it into Tableau as um, an image button. So um, we have this button here. If I edit this image, we can just choose a different image for the, the button. That's it was actually an image only. I don't think that these are actual buttons. Yeah, let me just bring one in. Let's just bring in a navigation button. So you can see this navigation button has this, this text. It looks kind of old, out of date, but we can change it to an image button and we can bring in an image. And again, there's lots of advantages of that. Just, just to, for the simple fact of telling your users where they're going when they press that button, uh, I think is well, well worth the time. Now I do have a template. Ken and I decided that we, uh, we saw such a need for this that we just built a hundred buttons in PowerPoint. Uh, this is actually on my Tableau public page as well, but you can download this into um, a PowerPoint template. You can take these buttons, you can change the icons, you can change the text, you can change the color, but you have these sort of buttons, you know, some of these sort of 3D buttons, simple rounded buttons, um, toggle buttons, all kinds of things. We created all these in PowerPoint. Uh, you can use them, download them, and, and use them in your, in your visualizations. Um, so that you kind of give your users a little bit more information. All righty. Just a couple more to go. Fonts. Um, fonts are really kind of this interesting thing in Tableau. Um, there are uh, historically we talk about these these web safe fonts. So. I kind of get, I'll come back to that in a second. Here are four different custom fonts that I have on my uh, laptop. I use this stuff for Tableau Public stuff that I've done. Um, and, you know, this is kind of shaky, nervous font or this like scary looking font. So I had downloaded these fonts. Uh, I installed them on my laptop. I added them to this visualization. And then I went to my home PC and I looked at them and they look like this. This nervous font looks like, I don't know, Times New Roman or something like that, or Georgia. Um, and what's happening is there's only, there's, there's only X number of web safe fonts. The problem is I've installed this on my laptop, but it's not installed on my, on my home computer. And if you install a custom font, there's a good chance that it's not gonna be on your viewers uh, PC, right? So uh, historically, we've talked about these web safe fonts. These are the ones that are listed here. These are fonts that are installed on most computers, Macs and PC, um, that are going to be safe most of the time. Uh, you probably are familiar with this list. The problem is they're not always safe. Uh, my brother did a blog post called Demystifying Fonts in Tableau, where he actually talked with the the, the the team uh, at Tableau, the developing developer team at Tableau, the only true safe font is the Tableau font. It's installed with server, it's installed with T Tableau online, it's installed with uh, Tableau public. It is the only font that will render the same on everybody's computer 100% of the time. Um, so keep that in mind. All these other fonts, they'll work, I, I don't know the percentage, I use them pretty interchangeably. I, uh, they seem to work most of the time, 99% of the time, but the only true one is Tableau. But just keep in mind, if you're using custom fonts, uh, you shouldn't, uh, you, you're not, it's not gonna render properly on most people's computers. So there's a trick to that as well. And I've done that. And I think you saw this visualization. This is all Avenir font. This is uh, a total custom font, not installed with Tableau, not web safe. And how we get around that, we bring it in as an image. So we do what I just did in PowerPoint, like for my buttons, and I type text in PowerPoint, I select it. So let's keep refreshing this chart, it's kind of complicated, so it takes a little while to render, but. So I save that as an image and I bring it into Tableau as an image. One major downfall about bringing things in as images is they are not captured by, uh, by screen readers. So if you have people with disabilities using screen readers, it's not gonna read an image. Uh, so you can actually right click on an image and add alt text to it. The text is pretty short. So this is not gonna fit. 
but you could certainly put the word tornado or count by month selected and not selected, those types of things in the alt text to allow it to be captured by screen readers. But if you're gonna use custom fonts and it's really important to use custom fonts, you'll probably have to bring that in as a reader. It looks like Tableau uh, public aired out on me for some reason. All right, I think this is the last one. I'm talk just a little bit about white space. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I think it's really important. I don't think we do enough of it. I think, generally speaking, uh, we've all kind of learned that we want to try and just pack this dashboard, our dashboards, with information. And I agree, we want to get as much information we can in a dashboard and, and allow our users to, you know, really dig in. But there's a problem if we don't have enough white space. So. Uh, on the right is a visualization I created for Tableau Public uh, a couple of years ago. And on the left, I just took the white space from it just to kind of show what this thing looks like. And uh, these are, are NFL, uh, national, uh, American football players um, that did you know, some special things as, in their first year in the league. And it's hard to really break these guys apart. It's hard to tell where one starts and one ends. Um, it's just has no flow to it and it's really difficult to read where if we add just a little bit of white space to separate these guys out to separate the charts from each other it's really easy to read it really has this nice flow we can kind of see this left to right we can see the separation uh, so don't be afraid to use white space a lot of people like to use borders and uh, containers and these these boxes I just might rather take, and, and I don't do much of that. I just rather take and and replace that stuff with white space, and it kind of creates these natural borders, really, really clean uh, designs. Uh, I always talk about this guy when I talk about white space. You may be familiar. He is he's from from India, Pradeep Kumar, um, friend of mine, and um, just incredible data visualization artist. Uh, everybody always loves his stuff, but he just does a really great job. I'm trying to look at one of these that's really well spaced, but he does always does a really great job. This one might take a bit to load. This is one he did for Iron Viz, but just an incredible job of, of using white space. And uh, anybody, well, Tableau Public might have just kind of bombed out on me right in the middle of this presentation, guys. Yeah not looking like it's going to load oh there it goes just loading really slow but he just does this really great job of white space he's not trying to fill the screen and you know he has the sort of white space between the charts um, between the sections um, and uh, just really has a really great flow so if you ever want to be inspired by somebody that uses great white space come to Pradeep Kumar G's um, Tableau Public account and and just check out what he's done and, and yeah, I mean just really really fantastic job so all right that's all I have at the moment um, like you said we can uh, take questions here and if uh, again if you want to check this out in more detail you can go to this website uh, that particular link and it breaks it down into uh, into significant detail and uh, happy to take some questions. Mm, hi, Kevin. Uh, this is Abhilash here. Uh, it was great uh, listening to you and uh, and the tips and the techniques that you are uh, just uh, making it available to us. Uh, I'm following you from a long time. Uh, just one question. Uh, it's just that considering uh, the live domains, as you mentioned that you use your techniques uh, like there is a separate way to use your techniques that you use on your Tableau public as well as use use on your work related purpose. Same things happens to all of us considering uh, like considering the credit space, like considering the finance domain where the numbers matter more rather than visualization or rather than the storytelling in the in the uh, in the day to day uh, things. So in that way, uh, how one person can implement a little bit of visualization in his or uh, in his domain so that it can be uh, implementable also and it can be a good way to storytell also like how can he integrate it embedded basically could you, could you repeat the question i'm not sure i understood uh, the, the uh, specific so basically, question yeah so basically uh, my question is considering the domains like finance credit 
and insurance domains in these domains mostly the number matter more uh, for the stakeholder or for the end user so mm -hmm. they don't want like maybe they don't want or they don't, they don't want to go through the process of uh, visualization in a much more matter and they just consider uh, the numbers to be present in a cross tab manner like gotcha okay yeah so in that way how someone can integrate a little bit of visualization techniques or uh, make it a more uh, storytell way like how can they implement it in a more good way uh, i'm yeah i'm tracking with you now okay uh, yeah so i think one of the main techniques um that people use to sort of push in that direction uh, from tables to more data visualization. I, I, I will be clear, we use tables sometimes. Uh, so I, I don't think tables are always bad, but you're right. There's a lot of people that say, just give me the numbers. Now, I think us as data visualization pra practitioners and, and, and professionals can could tell, um, you know, it's a lot easier to look at charts and see trends than to look through you know, tables and tables of numbers, right? So we know the advantage and we know that we can help our customers if we do present this in, in a more visual manner than in a, a table. So, but one of the techniques to try to sort of push in that direction is to change a table to a highlight table. So you still have, you still provide the numbers, you still provide that information to it, to a user. Um, but maybe you highlight, uh, you know, you use the highlights to, and if you know what I mean by highlight table, let me just jump back here. Um, but wrong thing. Got all these little sharing things in my way. I got to move them. Sorry. Um, highlight table. So something like this. So, you know, you have this table of numbers for your, for your, um, for your user. Um, but if you can add this highlighting, then all of a sudden they can start to see trends uh, without combing through all these numbers. You know, imagine there was no color on here, we wouldn't be able to see these trends. But now we can start to see these deeper red or deeper blues where we can see where all our sales figures have, are happening. You know, where we have the most orders you know, down towards what Christmas time or something like that. So, so that is one technique to start to move a user towards um, more data visualization and away from tables. Gives them their tables, but gives them the, the more um, insights as well. Um, you can kind of do the same thing using bars as well. So you can start to move away from this and start to move towards bars as, uh, over time as well. But I think this is probably your first step into moving someone into, into data visualization and less tables. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah. Hello, am I audible? We can hear you. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I have a one question. Uh, so when we are working with live data and when we replace the data, the color palette changes for the subcategories <laughs> and the yeah. hierarchy, hierarchy, <laughs> hierarchy which we have made on the first first time that also goes away so is there any way we can fix it i don't i don't have any options <laughs> it's a common problem that i've heard um <clears throat> and it seems to happen just with live data sources right because i I'll, I'll change my published data sources around every now and then and i don't have that problem but it seems to happen with i think just with live data sources i apologize but i have no solution because I, I i go through the same thing and it seems random. It doesn't seem to do it every time, but it does seem to do it uh, quite often. So I apologize. I got no answer for you. <laughs> Kevin, I have, yeah, I have uh, one or two questions for you. I mean, uh, the guys who joined us today, um, some of them are students. I know them personally also. And I wanted to take this opportunity to, to ask you this question, which might help these guys. So what happens generally is uh, some of these guys, uh, they come from a non-coding or a non-technical background, right? So uh, we, like we at Claymatex, we also do training around different things, uh, including visualization. So these guys, a bit scared uh, of coding in, in platforms like Python and R, and which is obvious because people from commerce background or some other non-techie background might not be that adept at doing those things. But 
I do think that's my personal opinion that if somebody wants to make a foray into data science, and that's a buzzword these days, everybody wants to have a piece of pie over there. So I think for them, data visualization is a kind of a entry room because that doesn't need that level of coding. So can you just kind of uh, put uh, more points on that uh, thing and also yeah. let my students here? So I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my background. So, you know, in college, I took a computer science class, a coding class, and that this is 26 years ago. I think it was Turbo Pascal or something crazy like that. And I took it with my brother, my identical twin brother, Ken. Ken loved it and I hated it. And I never took another coding class again. Um, I ended up getting a degree in, in uh, applied mathematics. Uh, and he ended up getting a degree in computer science. And he spent um, 10 years coding. He spent another 10 years as a database administrator. And then he got into Tableau, somewhere around there, some, something in that frame. I spent most of my career doing sort of analytics in Excel. So I have um, pretty much zero coding experience. Uh, I don't know how to use R. I've used it. I don't use it well. I don't know how to uh, use Python. Um, my brother can use all those tools. I mean, he can write code and he, he's a database guy. And so I can pretty much do Tableau and SQL. Uh, and I learned SQL in the last couple of years. Uh, I've, and um, so I've learned to, to do the types of things you do in SQL and the types of things you do in Tableau in just a, a couple of years time. And, um, and I feel really confident about my future. I don't, I don't, I'm not a data scientist. I would not consider myself that, but I am a data visualization practitioner and there's tons and tons of opportunities uh, to, to be in, <clears throat> to be just a data visualization practitioner. You do not have to be a data scientist um, to be successful. I have lots of friends that are just doing this. You know, we have a whole team of people that are just doing data visualization for a living. Um, I'm not saying that data, a, data, a data science piece isn't, isn't extremely important and, and you could be very successful with that. We have a couple of data scientists on our team. The guys are brilliant. Um, very, very, very valuable to our organization. So there's lots of value there, but there's also lots of value and lots of opportunity in, in data visualization. And I would agree, it's, it's, it's easier to sort of get the understanding of how to write calculations and code, if you want to call it coding in Tableau or in SQL, um, than it is to, you know, learn all these different tools. So, um, so from my perspective of somebody with very, very little coding experience with, with, without uh, experience in, in R and Python and all these other, you know, tools, um, you can, you know, I've been using Tableau less than three years. Uh, so you can become very good at this if you put in the energy and you put it in the time and you don't have to have this intense technical background. The greatest thing about, about data visualization and, and, I'll, and I know more about Tableau and spe specifically is people come from all kinds of walks of life. I've done kinds of some surveys, some informal surveys. Uh, my boss, uh, Jeffrey Schaefer, is has a master's in music. He's a, he's a trumpet player. My former boss was an organ player. Um, Bridget Cogley, a Tableau Zen master, was a American sign art uh, sign language. Uh, she did sign language for a living. Um, there's uh, Josh Smith. He goes by Data Jackalope. He is um, uh, he was a poet. <laughs> he was a poet. Uh, and he's, he's, he's more into data science and Tableau now. So there's these, these groups. If you look at just the, the 34 Zen masters in the world, there's this enormously diverse uh, backgrounds. And many people did not come from a coding background. So um, I, I think that uh, that shouldn't be a worry. I mean, you do have to work hard. You do have to learn some things that other people may have already learned, you know, uh, doing date calculations and things like that. But it's certainly not impossible. And I, I became Zen after two years and I didn't have that background. So uh, I, I could keep talking about this for hours, but I, would, I wouldn't worry too much about that because uh, uh, with the practice, you'll be able to learn it. Thanks, Kevin. I think that would kind of boost up the spirits of the <laughs> young guys. 
So la last webinar we had, and they were saying that most of the times we go for a, uh, for an interview. So we generally ask to have an experience. So that's a cash to do for them. So I was telling them that um, don't think yourself uh, as being a drop in the ocean. You you are an ocean in a drop. So I mean, uh, I, I think that was, I, I, that's the reason behind this webinar. I wanted to kind of have a motivation for the young guys. And I think you did a great job over here. Uh, any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. I, I have one question. Um, hello, Kevin. I just hello. uh, I just wanted to ask, like, uh, if you suggest any particular size for a dashboard, because um, in Tableau Public, when I see the dashboards, like they usually use like the long portrait mm -hmm. orientation. So I just wanted to ask if there's any particular size you suggest. Uh, so so yeah, Tableau Public people are kind of doing whatever they want, and I do a lot of excuse me, a lot of long dashboards on Tableau Public as well. At work, our, our general standard size is 1200 width and 800 height. Um, easy to see on the screen. I uh, do that, we do vary that a little bit. We don't have this this sort of standard size, though we've kind of, kind of made it a standard of 1200 by 800. We do have some that are 1400 in width and 900 in height. Um, I think you want to stay, if you want something on one screen, uh, which is I think most dash, most business type dashboards, I'd stay within 1400 width and 900 in height. Um, again, we use 12, 1200 by 800. Um, but there are certainly cases, you know, where you build dashboards that are more long form and where you want a user to be able to scroll down. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of have a little bit more freedom, but, but yeah, we, we try to keep everything on one screen using 1200 by 800. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kevin. Uh, Satakshi here. Hi. I would like to uh, know your thoughts on Tableau prep and other data modeling and cleansing practices, because it's, I think it's really important that the data is cleansed before we actually start making visualizations on top of it. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, standard practice or a better way to cleanse your data? And what do you think about Tableau prep? Is it like uh, so? Um, so I'll talk from from my experience. We're a small company, and we tend to um, bring in our data via SQL. So um, I, we have just a three three person team um, of our business intelligence team. And we write SQL code to uh, bring in our, to, as our data source typically. So, so we kind of are, are designing that the way we want it to be designed. We have an Altrix, Altrix license at work that rarely gets used. We also have Tableau Prep, which we don't use very often. Tableau Prep is, Altrix is, is incredible. Tableau Prep, also a really, really good tool, um, much more cost effective than, than Altrix. Um, and I think it's incredibly powerful. It's gotten, it's got way better over the last two years, uh, you know, from when it initially uh, came out. I've used it some, I haven't used it a ton. Uh, and I think it's a, a really great tool. Um, I would, I'll, I'll take, a, take a moment to promote um, my, my coworkers. Uh, they just did a tableau prep session with somebody named Jenny Martin from the Information Lab um, in, in London. They did that session yesterday. Uh, they, uh, it's uh, Danushki De La Vera and, um, and Jennifer Dahls who both work with me and they run a website called Her Data, H-E-R space D-A-T-A. -A, and, um, and I think it's .net. And um, they just did that uh, a full like almost an hour session with with Jenny Martin about Tableau Prep. So that'd be a good one to check out. Uh, you can kind of see some of the simple stuff as well as some more more complex stuff of, of how they clean data using Tableau Prep. But but yeah, I think a lot of people are excited about Tableau Prep. I think it's getting better and better and it keeps closing the gap uh, to Altrix. The Altrix is I think is is, you know, more intense. Um, but um, I think Tampa Prep still comes with a desktop license, if I don't, re if I recall. So and that's a lot more cost effective. So, but I, but honestly, I don't use it a ton. But I did just use it the other day, and it was it was super easy. It made things really really simple. 
Oh, thanks, Kevin. I just have one more. Uh, mostly, like, uh, while the standard charts, like bar charts, they depict the data very perfectly. Like, we know what the values are visually as well. But at times, clients, uh, they demand some they out of the box visualization to make the dashboards really, you know, jazzy and they look pretty. <laughs> so, what, uh, like you said, we can use icons to, uh, you know, uh, make, make the dashboards uh, pop up. But uh, are there some charts which you would recommend that are really, you know, eye pleasing, but at the same time they make data reading easy? I mean, you don't have, they don't overshadow the data part of it. Could you suggest some charts, some um, visualization? Yeah, um, I think that's that's a little bit of a tricky question because f for me, you know, the data ends up dictating the chart. Um, I still think. I still think a well-designed bar chart can be absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, I, I, if you put a scatter plot on, on, a, on, a, on a dashboard and design it in, in a certain way, it can be absolutely gorgeous. Let me, just because Pradeep is so good. Got this control in the way and I don't know how to move it. There we go. I mean, this is a simple scatter plot but look how nice <laughs> look how gorgeous that thing is um and he's generally just using a tech you know a dual axis he's got you know uh, an outline and then he's got a, you know a circle with with some opacity here so um so i think they're more so than using a, a specific you know chart type uh that is a little more wowing i think if if you add some design behind your charts, you can have these sort of wow charts, this sort of wow factor. Uh, Pradeep is, would be a great place to, to start. This is a, a visualization he just did. Let me see if I can put it in full screen. For some reason, Tableau Public throw that stuff off to the right. But you can see he's got these you know, icons up at the top. He's got this sort of background you know, behind everything. He's using these, these sort of semi-transparent containers um, you know, beautiful bar charts, um, you know, this sort of dot strip plot. There's another uh, scatter plot that's just incredibly well designed. So I think, um, it, you know, at least in my thought process, it, you can do some of these crazy charts. Um, and maybe there's some that are, are good for the use case. Maybe you could use a radio bar chart if it's, there's a time series or something like that that feels like a natural you know, circle or pro progression or something like that. But in general, I think you can do lots of things that um, can make your dashboard incredibly beautiful and still use the best chart types for the job. See, it's he, the one thing he doesn't have an, he doesn't have an access on his bar chart. It's, they're floating bars and it's bugging me. So, but other than that, the thing's like perfect, right? So, so I don't, I don't, I couldn't say one specific chart. Um, you know, again, I think the, the data kind of dictates that, but I think some design behind your standard charts can make something just, you know, incredibly gorgeous. Like, like, like Pradeep does such a good job of. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. Sure. Any other question, guys? Uh, one last, Kevin, I think uh, more to do with enlightening these guys. So generally, when you say you take out the base map, and I think we will not take more of time after this. <laughs> so the base map and take out of it. And if you put a filter on a typical geography, the whole uh, country map gets distorted because let's say taking out a specific state out of a country, you will find those holes in that map, right? And that yeah. might not be correct uh, for, for multiple reasons. I'm not going to the reasons, <laughs> but there might be multiple reasons behind it. So can you tell the guys how we can they can get away with that? Yeah, yeah, that, and that that's exactly the point that I brought up. If if you're if you're missing data or if you filter, like you said, if you filter things out, um, you're going to have those those gaps. In that case, you're probably going to have to use um, the base the base map. Um, there are ways around that, I guess. If let me just go back here. Um, again, this thing's in the way. Let's see. That's not it. This is it right here. If we were to, like you said, if we were to take this base off and then I were to say filter Wyoming or out, or I didn't have va values for Wyoming, I'd have this hole here. 
where if I had the base, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that. So agreed, that is the main problem when filtering this out. Now, um, ways to get around it, you can, um, uh, I think I have this up. You can use, that's not the best. Tablet is refreshing on me. You can use shape files. Um, you can use shape files to show to um, to bring in different map projections. This is for the United States, but I'm sure they have them for all over the world. Um, so that's one option. You can use. Uh, I will tell you, at my office, uh, we use maps about one percent of the time, and we use hex maps for almost everything. So generally speaking, if geography doesn't matter. And then hex maps are typically better. The reason behind that is, you know, if you look at, I, I should show it, Montana's, I think, like 20 times the size of New Jersey, but New Jersey has like 10 times the population. So uh, Montana gets this visual weight in a normal map. So we tend to use hex maps for almost everything. So, um, but if you are bound and determined to use a standard map and you are going to be filtering out values or missing values, you're going to have to show that base layer. Thanks, Kevin. So, uh, any other questions, guys? Great. So, I think we have stretched a bit from a uh, great time, but uh, once again, Kevin, I think this is just the beginning of the end. I will bug you more with our questions <laughs> as and when we get time. <laughs> I kind of represent my uh, young guns out here uh, who are there, and we, I'll request you, I mean, I'll tag you wherever I can, whenever they post something and you have always motivated them and I'll, I thank you that support will continue. And guys, um, you can kind of bug Kevin as and when you want, but not with any, with some valid questions. And I think he's a great person. He'll never let you down. I mean, he's always there to help you. He's a great person as I told. And once again, Kevin, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, thank you. Me and my team at Playmetrics, we're really helpful for this. And for all the participants out here, Thank you so much for your time and keep learning, keep growing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Thank you, Kelvin.